Like we are live. All right. Well, welcome everyone to AAC in the Cloud 2020. Uh, we are proud to have um, Alma. Ariad, oh, I am going to slaughter. No, that is that correct? I'm going to go. Maria, yeah. Well, well. Oh, Maria, Maria. There's a D in there. Uh, Sarah and Melissa who are going to be presenting next. Um, this is going to be a fascinating topic here. So I'm going to just go ahead and and turn the time over. Uh, as far as those who are watching it live and want to be asking questions, uh, that will be in Slack channel three. So feel free to ask questions in Slack channel three and they will be monitoring questions there as well. So take it away. All right. All right. So hi everyone. Thank you guys for joining us today. I know that many of you guys are probably on summer vacation right now, and you've taken time out of your well-deserved break to learn more about AAC. So that shows a lot about your character and um, your love for your students or clients. So thank you guys for being here and thanks CoughDrop and AAC in the Cloud for having us. Uh, so today we're gonna be presenting about bilingual resources for AAC therapy, in particular, Spanish and English bilingual AAC therapy with Bilingue AAC, which is us. Um, and a little bit about Bilingue AAC, we met on Instagram and we actually haven't met in person yet, <laughs> but we all share a passion and curiosity for bilingual AAC. And we wanted to create solutions between um, the research in AAC bilingual therapy or lack thereof. Um, and then also somehow finding what is available and implementing that in therapy. Um, and we started in March, 2021, and we've met monthly, sometimes weekly uh, to discuss like our findings. We also created materials. We've created a whole website to host a lot of our materials. So we hope to inspire you guys to help inspire parents to continue the use of Spanish language at home and to foster that bilingualism with our AAC users. So a little bit about myself. My name is Alma. I'm a bilingual SLP um, in Northern California. I'm a school-based SLP uh, employed through the city of Santa Cruz, actually. And I run the Instagram account called AEC for You and Me. And there I focus a lot about um, bilingualism. I talk about um, accessibility and AEC, along with other topics. Um, and I actually co-created another um, AEC account. It's called diverse AEC. And there we've made a bunch of YouTube videos about like creating a code switch button and adding pronouns and making things be accessible for diverse AEC users. And from there, Bilingue AEC sprouted about and I really have now, um, I'm, I'm working still on both, but with Bilingue AEC, I'm specifically focusing with this group on uh, Spanish and English AEC therapy. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Maria. Hi everyone, so I'm Maria De Leon. I'm a bilingual SLP working at the Assistive Technology Exchange Center uh, of Goodwill of Orange County. So I am currently located in Southern California and I serve uh, Orange County and LA County. So that's like a really big area. Um, so uh, I usually do a lot of AEC ev evaluations, AEC trials and AEC trainings. Um, I'm a member of ASHA and also a member of the SIG-12. Um, I also uh, have the account Code Switch SLP, which I, um, you know, I created and I post a lot of uh, AEC-related content. Hi, everyone. I'm Melissa Tapia. I am a bilingual bicultural SLP from the Chicagoland area. I'm the owner of Hablame Speech Therapy. I'm a home-based uh, pediatric bilingual uh, private practice, and I um, handle the Instagram uh, Hablame de Language, where I post a lot about bilingualism, early language intervention, and um, AAC as well. Hi. My name is Sarah. I'm an SLP and AAC specialist in Northern California. I have my LSH, 
LSH credentials and ASHA membership. This is my 13th year as a school-based SLP and I work with students from four to 21 years old of varying cognitive and physical disabilities. So some disclosures, uh, it's not long. <laughs> uh, we are co-creators of bilingualaac.com. Uh, some of the resources that you will see in this presentation are available on our website. Some of them are free resources, some of them are paid. So for our learning outcomes today, um, participants will be able to describe components of bilingualism. Uh, participants will be able to identify evidence-based bilingual Spanish AAC interventions, and participants will be able to locate bilingualaac.com resources for professionals and families. Awesome. So let's get started um, diving into the types of bilingualism. So it's really important to understand uh, the different types of bilingualism when you have a student or client on your caseload, you need to determine exactly, you know, how they've been developing their language. So we'll start here with the simultaneous bilingualism. Uh, these type of bilingual children are exposed to more than one language um, prior to the age of three, typically from birth and on. So they develop two or more languages equally or near uh, equally through exposure, frequent opportunities, to use each language. Um, then you have the sequential bilingualism. This is what a lot of us see a lot more in the schools as well with our English language learners. This is when children are exposed to additional languages after uh, the age of three or when they're older. So they're considered those uh, sequential or successive bilinguals. Um, Sequential bilinguals, they do differ slightly more than from what we would call receptive bilinguals because they've, um, with the receptive bilinguals, they've had little or no opportunity to build on a other language prior to that age of three. Um, so receptive bilingualism is where children are learning two or more languages, but they have fewer opportunities to speak one of those languages. Um, they are likely to understand um, a lot more than they're able to express. So it is important um, when we are uh, seeing our clients for the first time, having a case uh, language history form with the parents, having that conversations of like, what are the languages they're exposed to in the home? Um, there's uh, on our website, which we'll talk about later, we'll discuss more of those areas where you will be able to obtain these forms to kind of um, be very thorough about like, well, what, uh, what's the language of the television shows they watch in? Um, what are the languages that are used around them in their environment? Um, it's important to determine these factors for uh, the treatment and as well as assessment. Um, so here we have laid out the language dominance continuum. So again, continuum meaning that it's never gonna be static for these children. So it, it can always fluctuate. Um, so this is from Peña et al. Uh, so we'll start first with our English dominant uh, students. So these are our children. So a functional monolingual English a speaker would be someone who is considered to use, have an English input and output of 80% or more of the time. Um, on the other side of that spectrum, we have children who would be Spanish dominant. So they would be considered a functional monolingual Spanish. So 80% or more of their input and output is Spanish. Um, we see uh, those bi bilingual children who then we would consider English dominant. So this is that their input of English is 60% to 80%. Um, you see a lot of this uh, with children who are in the school environments where, you know, uh, the language of instruction is English, they're speaking a lot more English with their peers, so you see that continuum kind of shift to that end, where they are still considered bilingual, but with an English dominance. Um, and then you have your bilingual Spanish dominant children who have Spanish uh, input output 60 to 80% of the time. Um, this is, we kind of see it with our like younger school age children. Um, they're definitely more Spanish dominant, but they do have a uh, bilingual access to English and Spanish or another language, their home uh, native language. And then you have a balanced bilingual. So essentially here, they have an input output of 40 to 60% in either language. All right, so this is an article by an SLP and it talks about Article 19 of the United Nations. And it's mostly about communication as a human right. So effective communication um, might be compromised as a human right for 
people who don't speak the minor the majority language so they might be uh, speaking a different language a different dialect or just overall the minority language as well as it's also compromised for those who use AEC to communicate so um, just overall in terms of like understanding communication as a human right, it is compromised for both of these people, for the people who uh, don't speak the majority language as well as complex communicators. And then um, in terms of bilingualism, the myth is that if they struggle learning one language, they're gonna struggle learning two, and that's just the myth. Our brains have the capacity to learn two, maybe even more languages. In fact, that's the common culture of the world. They speak their language uh, aside from another language. So I want to look at bilingual, we should look at bilingualism as more of like a computer program, right? So our bilingualism brain or our brain has a large, vast capacity like a computer does to um, contain different programs. And so uh, it's not to the detriment of another language. In fact, uh, programs or different languages are able to be filled in our vast capacity brains. And similarly, dominance fluctuates. So uh, some programs in our brain, some languages in our brain get updated more often. So we might have uh, more Spanish, um, or sorry, more dominance in French, for example, after, after we've taken a course in it in high school. And then maybe once we, you know, a, a few years go by and we kind of lose dominance. So our programs don't get updated as often. And so um, that's why we should uh, also understand that bilingualism dominance fluctuates over time. So it's important um, while we while we think about bilingualism and like what age they acquired the first language and what age they acquired the second language, that's all very important, but it's most more important to determine what is the level of proficiency of the student at this particular time because uh, bilingualism fluctuates. You're muted, Maria. Like I muted right when it was my turn. <laughs> um, so this is a question for whoever is live. Um, so, oh, I don't know, I did something. Hold on, give me one second, here it is. Okay. So how many of you think that you need to know Spanish to provide culturally affirming Spanish, Spanish services? So type your answers in the Slack, mm -hmm. track three. Okay, well, I'm gonna go to the next slide and we'll see what, um, what just kind of comes in. Lots of people saying no, not required, but it helps. No, but a little bit of knowledge can help. Yeah, that's right. So actually based on the American Speech Language Hearing Association, ASHA, uh, providing uh, their statement on providing culturally and linguistically responsive services, uh, the individuals that uh, we work with must have opportunities to communicate both at home and in the community in the languages or languages that will most effective when it that are most effective within those contexts. So therefore family preferences regarding linguistic priorities should be reflected in service prohibition. Um, so yes, that's right. Like it helps to be, to speak our students language but it is not necessary, necessarily necessary for us to provide uh, culturally affirming services. Um, I do want to uh, kind of warn that as an SLP, we do have to be aware of our limitations. Um, even though we might want to provide culturally affirming services, we really do have to do our research to find out what is the best way to do that. Um, so for example, um, try to always have a translator if you can. Um, if your school district or your facility does not provide a translator, you can reach out to a colleague. Um, you can reach out to Bilingua AAC and we can potentially help. Um, you can also reach out to family, uh, family members tend to be a really helpful resource um, and uh, it kind of opens up that uh, communication between the therapist and the family if you do start involving family um, and especially in their language. Um, the most important thing here is that we want to make sure that families know that their language and their culture is uh, appreciated and that it is important and that we don't want to be um, just forgetting about their language uh, because it is really what makes them um, so uh, talking a little bit more about like the bilingual therapy, um, I do wanna mention that in AEC, there's a little bit, there's little research of AEC 
and bilingualism. So a lot of these terms have been borrowed from, um, you know, second language acquisition education. Um, and we've tried to kind of explain the different types of bilingual therapy using AAC. Um, so uh, we had a discussion with Dr. Gloria Soto, and she did explain to us a little bit about these different approach um, and how um, no matter what approach we are taking, we definitely want to be taking a social cultural approach. So for cross linguistic approach, this uh, kind of means that you are using the uh, L1 or the stronger language to be able to teach that second language. Um, so in the case of AAC, this might look like a Spanish dominant session where you might be having a therapy where you, you are mostly talking in Spanish, but you are bringing English to kind of teach that concept or teach a vocabulary word. Um, in the bilingual approach, we're talking more of using both English and Spanish. Um, and based on the templates that you will see in the future, we had in mind something more of a bilingual approach. So where the SLP or the therapist or teacher doesn't necessarily have to know the language in order to provide bilingual therapy. Um, so here would be you using uh, maybe English, um, but also incorporating Spanish whenever it's appropriate. Um, so I'm going to show uh, this YouTube video of a session. I'm going to click out and go to YouTube of how, um, so this is kind of how a bilingual approach would look like. Um, I want to kind of repeat that you don't necessarily have to know the language as long as you do have a guide of like maybe words like a target guide of words that you might want to model. So Bubbles. Mas, ¿Tú quieres más burbujas, Maya? Gracias. Bubbles. More bubbles. Más. Burbujas. Más burbujas. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to exit. I can figure it out. <laughs> I've been getting paid $1,000 a month. It's okay, great. All right. You're doing great, Maria. Yeah, I just like the tech part, <laughs> it's a little tricky, but okay. So um, either way of the approach, there's definitely a lot of different approach that you can take in order to teach Spanish or at least incorporate Spanish in your therapy sessions. Um, either way that you choose to do it, depending on your uh, level of proficiency in the native language, we do want to be uh, taking into consideration that we're taking a social cultural approach. Um, so what does that mean? So that means that language learning is rooted in the children's participation and culturally meaningful activities. Uh, language use has a profound effect on children's development because language not only develops through participation in social cultural activities, but also mediates participation. Um, so basically what this means is that we, you know, we don't all grow up like in a vacuum, right? We are products of our environment. Um, and here culture and language are in the strictly <laughs> linked. So we cannot separate those two. So if we are language therapists, then we really do have to be taking into consideration the individual's culture um, and looking and preparing our materials and preparing our service and our even our evaluations to be able to meet that culture. Um, so here. Okay, so what do we know about bilingualism? So this is all research that we've created from research. And so we know that bilingual Spanish children as young as four to six years old are able to code switch. They can discriminate and recognize the different language AEC layouts. We also know that ASHA obligates us to provide culturally and linguistically appropriate services regardless of our own culture, practice setting or caseload demographics. We know that dual language learners with language impairment 
who receive bilingual vocabulary intervention will improve their receptive and expressive language in both languages. So we also know that facilitating bilingualism opens opportunities to practice and generalize linguistic skills across contexts, improve their interpersonal relationship with family members, and it preserves a client's culture and heritage. So um, here are some examples of uh, Latinx perceptions of AEC use. Um, I do want to warn that this is the study was done by McCord and Soto in 2004, and it studied uh, Mexican American families. All families are different, uh, but these statements or the research out there could be helpful to try to, uh, you know, try to give us an insight of what families are thinking, especially Latino families about AEC. Um, so. Uh, a lot of them, they reported that they feel like the AEC device is a school thing and that it is not a home uh, thing. And as you may all know, communication is happening everywhere at all times. So um, definitely because it, it's been, you know, it might be left on the backpack and it's not incorporated at home, then uh, families at home don't get the opportunity to learn more about the device. Um, also, they reported that they preferred signs over the device. And this is mostly because of, um, you know, they say they get by with signs. So there's no need to pull out this huge device. This article was written in 2004. So back then <laughs> the devices were huge and bulky. So yes, of course, there's no need for you to pull out a device if a parent is able to understand signs. Um, another important thing that they found in this study was that families reported frustration with the vocabulary and that it was not in their native language, therefore not functional. Um, families might see Oh, this next uh, point is really interesting because families uh, might see a professional as a person of high authority, which makes it difficult for equal partners in meetings. Um, so what that means is that there really is no interaction or exchange of ideas because a lot of Latino families do see the professionals as the experts. So they just kind of take in what they say, but then there's I see it as like a good and bad. Good because, you know, they're taking in what we're saying and they're not questioning us. But then the bad part is they're not questioning us. So then does that mean that they don't understand or, you know, what are their thoughts about it? Um, I actually did do um, a, my, on my graduate thesis was on parent perceptions and one of my findings, one of my findings was this, is that the same thing that professionals do parents, Latino parents do see professionals as like the experts and there's really no questioning. So as therapists, we can really use that to our advantage, but we, uh, but then we also have to consider that maybe um, it's not always, uh, oh, where am I? And then we have to consider that, um, that they might disagree, but for whatever reason, they're not, you know, voicing that disagreement. Um, another important thing about this article was mentioning they concluded that having families participate in like one day training or giving a device user manual is not enough to providing uh, family training, uh, you know, I, and this is very true because I found it in my practice as well. It's like just giving a parent a handout is not enough uh, because they just like look at it, even if it's in Spanish, they just like look at it and they like put it on the back of the car and then it's never to be seen again. So um, it's really important to uh, kind of work with families and walk them through the system. And one way to do that is not only by lecturing, but, but by having that interaction. So here's the question of the day. So can we translate English vocabulary to Spanish to teach Spanish AEC? So you guys could write your answers in the Slack here. So no, yeah. So let's uh, reveal the answer there. So yeah, so do and you in 2014, they say it is not enough to translate for the same vocabulary into a different language. So let's just take a look at what that would look like. So here is an overlay of touch chat. So we can say I play in English, but in Spanish, we would need to know the conjugations and we cannot say like yo jugar and the devices themselves are unable to auto conjugate on our behalf. So it's not a good idea to just translate. I also wanna add, um, because every culture is different, you know, 
most of these systems are organized in core words, right, in French words. And these core words are meant for the English language culture, not necessarily for the Spanish language culture. And you will find uh, in the research, you find that uh, certain cultures focus more on like nouns rather than these functional uh, words. So that's another reason why we really got to be careful about translating. Chanel, uh, just wanted to uh, in the track three said so not all the time because the syntax is different between the languages. That is correct. Yeah. So we met long in 20 last year of March, and this is like a discussion question for us, right? Like, can core words from English be translated into Spanish? And so here's a list of, oops. So I, so we learned that you could not do that. So I know what you're thinking, like I'm a monolingual therapist and I can't speak English and now we can't do direct translations. I'm right there with you. I'm a monolingual therapist and I've just been translating, but I'm here to give you guys some good news. We went into the research and we found the Spanish lexicon. There are limited amounts of research in Spanish AEC, but here's a list of the current ones. And two of them are actually from our mentor, Dr. Gloria Soto from San Francisco State. Hi, Gloria. <laughs> And in her research, both of them, she identifies the developmental Spanish vocabulary, the morphosyntax and the grammatical complexity of early developing Spanish lexicon. So based on these publications, there were some Spanish words that did overlap with some English core words, but not all of them. So don't worry if you've already started translating, like you, it might have actually overlapped anyway. Um, so Dr. Soto will be publishing some new evidence soon on the overlapping core words, so that should be coming out soon. So this is our premise here. Um, based on this um, expert from Senate Light and McNaughton, AAC users should be immersed in speaking AAC environments using the AAC modeling-based intervention. So given this, we can take that and frame our mindset. So what would happen if we immerse our students in Spanish AAC? So being able to explicitly teach them the different Spanish and English overlays while targeting appropriate early Spanish language lexicon. So again, that research that we took um, from Dr. Gloria Soto that was recently published using those um, appropriate word lists, those high that were um, you know, researched to be highly frequently used with those early language um, Spanish speakers. So what we are aiming to do now here is bridging that gap between research and implementation. So um, the what we usually, when we usually have is, um, research that's presented and it takes usually, I think uh, Maria and I were discussing this recently, a study showed that it takes up to like 14 or 17 years for the research to actually be accessed and implemented. So we're very excited that Dr. Gloria Soto um, has shared this with us as well. Um, we uh, have learned so much from her information and we're excited to actually take these word lists and use them. Um, so that's exactly what we've done. We're trying to bridge that gap. Um, and we're using a sociological approach in viewing language development through participation in social, um, social cultural activities. So what we know is this theory states that language use has a um, profound effect on children's development because we viewing the language, we know that it's not only about the development, it's not just in the participation, but it actually mediates participation as well. Um, so what we've done is built context specific boards relevant to common play activities, such as like meal times, playing with bubbles, um, pretend uh, play with cars, pretend play with dolls. And um, we've been able to integrate appropriate um, vocabulary, morphology and syntax guidelines based on um, Soto and Cooper's uh, syntax guidelines, the early um, and early Spanish vocabulary for children who use AAC development and the linguistic considerations, as well as um, Soto's protocol for the analysis of aided language samples in Spanish, which is called uh, PALS. Um, so we created also a framework for monolingual SLPs to feel confident and comfortable being able to use these um, uh, 
guidelines that we created these templates and uh, also inspired by the uh, considerations for the provision of services to bilingual children uh, to, who use AAC by Soto and you. Great, so here they are. Um, we have um, free uh, templates available on our website as well as a resource in our shop on our website. And we've created templates in regards to different communicative functions. So we have uh, meal times requesting, we have one for commenting, we have one for labeling. And maybe I should start off with like what these templates are not. Um, they're not meant to replace a bilingual AEC SLP by any means. Um, it's almost like uh, every time we say, you know, I'm not capable of doing it, I'm going to refer out, I'm going to refer out to a bilingual AEC SLP, we need to like kind of understand that that is like a unicorn, it's never going to come by. Uh, in fact, I think Melissa, Sarah and I might be like three of 300 in the US. Um, so I feel like these templates are now meant to empower you as a monolingual SLP to empower the parents to continue the Spanish language home use and also just like bridging that gap right or creating that bridge between home language and school language and just having them understand like bilingualism is a strength you have a code switch button and like you know this spanish overlay exists as opposed to what they're now being exposed to which is more like you are in a monolingual english class you're in a special day class and um it's all in english and then we say to parents like i don't know why you don't speak spanish to your kids it's like we've created like this environment where speaking english was kind of like the the norm. Um, so that's kind of what these templates are meant to do. It's like with the use of a bilingual para, for example, which I know a lot of classes have at least one person in their community that can like attest to these words, having the bilingual para maybe look through these words and say like, these are pertinent words that we use in our community. And then having these um, guidelines essentially to help you um, foster the Spanish language or help the parents as well foster the Spanish language. So um, really quickly, this is a, our pretend play cars, the requesting template. And so on the bottom left, you'll find what the therapist prompts are. So what you would say to the student or what you would model. So you'd model something like a get is, what do you want? And then you would also model the target words that you want them to produce, just like we would model um, with any other student, what you want them to say. So we've broken this down even further by parts of speech. So like any noun, that you should model, verbs, places, adjectives, other words. And then once there, you've done a lot of modeling, you would have some expected responses. So this is my, this might be something that you might see. Maybe after you've worked with parents, you might um, see some of these words that they've like learned to model. So the student might be able to say Cam carro or juguete, uh, car, car for carro, juguete and toy. And then the expanded utterance, this is once they start pairing um, two words. And I should also say that these templates are really meant for these emergent communicators that are at the single word level, right? So not yet pairing two words. Um, eventually, we thought about making those templates as well. But really, once you start pairing three to four words, that's when it gets tricky in terms of modeling the syntax. And you should really kind of rely on a native Spanish speaker to like do that modeling. So. These templates are more for the emergent communicators at the single word level, which we feel confident that you can, you should be able to do. Um, and so uh, that that's a little bit about the pretend play cars. I did want to mention um, one more. So under the word la, um, just la overall is a gender influence pronoun that usually follows a noun. So for example, the table would be la mesa. And in a, what I found, what we found through the research of the Spanish lexicon is that oftentimes the gender influence pronoun almost like lives with the noun. It doesn't go without it. You can't you usually don't say mesa, you would say la mesa, it's like combined. Um, and so therefore la is actually a more commonly used core word than more in Spanish. So this is an example of like we sh why we shouldn't translate core word list, right? Every like a lexicon is specific to that specific population and that specific phonetic alphabet even. So um, that's just an example of like, we, we actually did the work and looked through the research and found like the correct uh, Spanish core words. Um, and then the next one we have for you guys is pretend play, uh, oh, sorry, meal times, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, for requesting. So again, similarly, you would have the elicitation prompts of what the therapist would say, as well as things to model. And then this is what you would expect them to say after um, you've modeled some of these words. Um, eventually, what we want to um, create uh, is, well, right now we have um, 
this is a resource in our shop and we also have a step-by-step -step guide on how to use them. But in the future, we hope to have like workshops where we actually like teach you how to implement them with high fidelity. And then we also eventually want to create a YouTube channel where we talk about like how every um, uh, device is capable of modeling these words because not all of the devices have these words available, how you would have to program them into certain devices. Um, so that's kind of the goal with them. But we just, again, want you guys to feel empowered to create the bridge between the home language and the school language and have parents feel confident that this is something that they can do and um, that we honor, respect, and uphold their um, language. Yeah. I do want to add also to what uh, Alma is saying, like sometimes even learning a couple of words and using them in their language is honoring their language, right? Like not pretending like, oh, you know, you don't speak another language. Um, so you doing just that by itself, like families really appreciate that. Um, let me go ahead. And, and then I do want to share as well. Earlier, we shared a short clip. Um, that was, uh, I was using our bubbles uh, in, uh, template with a uh, student um, earlier this week. And it was really helpful even having it out. I myself am bilingual, but I wanted to see exactly um, how it was using it in real time. I know Sarah's also used them as well, but it is really helpful to have the words. Um, you can circle the words you want to target. Um, you know, but it, be prepared, be prepared when you're going to go into your sessions, it, knowing those specific words you want to target, it makes it so much easier. And, you know, it was great just having it on the go. Um, I had it on a pretty big sheet <laughs> and ready to go. And I really, I mean, I enjoyed using it as well. And parent also found it really helpful. So I left it for parents to use. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Okay, so now we can look at Bilingue AAC. So hopefully this, it did work. <laughs> Yay. Um, so this is our website. Um, so when you go in, uh, Bilingue stands for bilingual in Spanish. Uh, and AAC, of course, is alternative and augmentative communication. Um, and just a fun fact, AAC in Spanish is comunicación alternativa y aumentativa. So you just kind of like flip it. It would be like, say, uh, uh, <laughs> and it's basically the same. Um, so here um, you see we have our tabs for professionals, for parents, our freebies, our shop, and our services. Um, so within our professional, we did create a section for Spanish-speaking professionals, and we created a section for English uh, professionals. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the English. Um, we've included several resources. Um, the first one we have is the, it's like a log um, of different applications and the different languages provided. This was created by Diverse AEC and they gave us permission to post it on our website. Um, so this is really good for you if, you know, if you're trying to decide to choose a system that's uh, appropriate in terms of like language and code switching, this gives you a lot of valuable information. Um, this next one is the resources for English speaking professionals, um, and this is mostly a bunch of websites that we have uh, put together that are very helpful in terms of not only bilingualism, but also AAC. So um, you do find a lot of, um, if you go through them, like for example, this Aula Abierta Arasak, they have a lot of uh, core boards in Spanish. I did see a question on the chat. This is, do you have any recommendations about how to alter the core pages in Spanish for Tetra to Prolipo. Um, you know, sometimes we'll answer that specifically at the end, but this uh, eight, where is it? Aula Abierta Arasac, they have a lot of core board uh, in Spanish, but not only Spanish, but French and other several languages, Italian. Um, again, we have to be kind of careful with this because they tend to be also just direct translations. Um, but even though something might, you know, even though a dry, direct translation is not recommended, I would say that we have to do what, what we have. So I, I wouldn't just reject something just because it is because the research says that it doesn't have to be directed. Like that's not true. Uh, so you could use that board, but you can speak with the family to try to decide like what words mean, you know, what words are appropriate for that family unit. Um, so this is the resources for English and you'll find it's like very long and there's a lot. So if you go through here, you'll find uh, really valuable information. Um, we have a section for parents or para padres. This is supposed to be in Spanish and you'll find a lot of uh, handouts that we've made in Spanish and in English. 
Um, I do want to mention that if you go through these or if you have any ideas uh, for us in terms of uh, creating new handouts, feel free to email us. We're always willing to create uh, work for you guys so it can be helpful for your practice. Um, I've actually, in my practice, uh, we recently launched uh, Bilingue AAC maybe about a month or two ago. Um, so with my Spanish speaking families, I have start, I've started using the website as a guide <laughs> because I know that giving a handout is not, it's not necessarily efficient because like I mentioned, it's gonna end up in the back of a car. So I actually go through each, like if today we're talking about modeling or you know, communication functions, I go into here and then I review with them. Uh, step by step. I might show videos if that's the uh, case. Uh, I know my situation is a little different because I do get to work one-on-one -on -one with parents, um, but uh, but that would be like the ideal situation, a situation where you are reviewing these handouts with your parents and asking for questions, right? Um, so we have our freebies section here under the freebies. You'll find all of the handouts are in English and in Spanish, um, and you'll also find um, under our shop, we have the free templates. So you'll be able to go down and find some of those free templates that you can download. Uh, so for example, the Bilingual Espanol Mealtime Requesting and the Play Car Requesting. Um, I wanna show you guys the, we've created two uh, resources um, for uh, trying to help or equip us with the, I guess, kind of like the tools to be able to start or create or design not only therapy, but also like their AAC system, right? In the beginning of the presentation, we were talking about like um, how it's necessary to find out what type of bilingual, what type of, you know, in the continuum, where is this bilingual user in? Um, we've created these two uh, questionnaires or surveys. This one here is called the Spanish Parent Questionnaire for AAC. And then we have the Family Culture Survey. So the Spanish Parent Questionnaire for AAC um, is really asking questions about the family and the everyday routines of the family to help us understand uh, what words can we start adding on the system. Um, yes, we have those core words, but just the same as in, in English, uh, core words are not everything. And core words are just a guide for us to be able to figure out where we can start uh, teaching words or vocabulary. So this uh, survey does a really nice job at like interviewing the parent to try to figure out like what kind of words do you use? What kind of words are um, specific to your culture? Because um, even though I don't, even though they might speak Spanish, not all Spanish speakers are from the same na same nationality. We all come from different nationalities. And in one country, we might say something, a certain word, and then in another country, we might say it differently. So um, this questionnaire does a nice job trying to figure out those differences um, to customize our systems and to kind of customize our therapy as well. Um, for the family culture survey, um, this one is getting more into, uh, into the family's uh, language and, um, you know, what language do they speak the most? What are their perceptions and their goals for their child? Um, we do want to be aware more of like, who is in, this is more of the family unit and providing adequate family uh, training, like who makes decisions in your family? Um, you know, every culture is different. Um, a lot of in the Latino uh communities, not everyone, but in the Latino communities, uh, moms or mothers tend to be in charge of the educational uh, realm of like their kids, you know, the dad goes out and works and brings the bread home. And then moms are the ones that are like, dealing with like school and appointments and meetings. So we really want to be aware of like, what's the best way to reach you? You know, is it phone call? Is it like email? Like all of that kind of information is really nice for you to know in order to really um, reach the family and like let the family know that you're there for help. And um, yeah, so that's that. So these are two and you'll find these under our shop. Um, let me go here. Um, the last section that we have on, uh, on our website is the services. Um, so as Alma mentioned earlier, those templates 
Um, we plan in the future to have additional workshops or um, you know, have YouTube videos. But in the meantime, if you do have any questions, you can go into our uh, website and in the service tab, you can put in your information. And we do have, um, you know, information not only for parents, but also for teachers and SLPs. So feel free to like share our information with Spanish speaking parents, and maybe they're inclined to reach us and we speak Spanish, three of us at least speak Spanish, so we can definitely help. Um, we also offer consultations in Spanish and in English. Um, and we offer right now we are having a I think it's like for if you contact us that we can uh, you know help you kind of figure out uh, any issues that you might be having or questions that you have with any of your clients. So that's that. Um, let me go back. So. I did want to add one more thing about um, the question about how to alter core board pages in Spanish for touch chat or polo quo to go. Uh, another thing that we've recently learned is like if the device is not fulfilling the needs of the student, you can also add an alternative method like maybe a core word or another um, uh, like light tech board that has words that are relevant. So like while we're using touch chat, we also have this um, on the side because AAC is all encompassing, right? It could be gestures, it could be also the light tech board, and then it could also be their device. So um, if it's not uh, meeting the needs of your student, you can always provide what they need um, light tech. Yeah, and I do want to mention the Spanish parent culture and the uh, family culture surveys. Um, these have been also based on the research, limited research sets out there, but we've really gone and read and tried to get everything as possible and whatever, you know, uh, we're not like necessarily doing, okay, this is what the research is because evidence-based practice is much more than just, you know, research, right? Uh, it's also you as a clinician and uh, your personal experiences and external evidence and internal evidence. So we've taken all of that into consideration to uh, kind of create these. Um, other than that, I think that, um, let me go back here. Um, so yeah. yeah. So I'm just going to thank you guys so much for attending our session and for AAC in the cloud for hosting us. And we hope that we added to your understanding of Spanish bilingual AAC. And we hope you inspire everyone here too, to also question how we do intervention, to trailblaze some new intervention solutions, and to start connecting with other professionals across the world. So we can begin to take further questions on the Slack. Um, if you have any questions about our materials, um, we will be continuing to develop more. Um, we just got our license for board makers so we can start creating more boards. Um, yeah, so um, I think Lauren, she asked, do you have any recommendations about how to alter the core pages in Spanish for touch chat and protocol to go or any other common, commonly used SGD applications? Yeah, I think we kind of um, touched on that one a little mm -hmm. bit. Okay. Um, I did also want to share very quickly, we have a Facebook group as well, Bilingua AEC, and um, there we uh, will post whatever we're finding, but you can also feel free to ask questions on there, and other AAC SLPs have, like, are responding, which is really good. It's almost like in real time, mm -hmm. um, an answer to your question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then, um, you know, just another big takeaway, I know we talked about the social cultural approach, but when we are working with um, bilingual AAC users, it's definitely a family centered approach. So um, even, you know, if they're, you know, a lot of us are school based SLPs, uh, you know, the language of instruction could be in English, but it's so important to if you have a bilingual um, AAC user that they have access to all the languages that they are exposed to, um, whether it be light tech or you know, high tech, but that is definitely uh, one big takeaway, giving them that access um, and then making this a family-centered approach. Yeah, any more questions for us? Where's... <laughs> like nobody's uh, typing in any questions, but uh, yeah, uh, checking to see if anybody else was asking questions. But uh, if anybody else has any other questions, I guess they can continue to type them in in Slack or email the group there. Um, but that was a 
a great presentation and a lot of things to consider when uh, when learning in Spanish and actually many other languages as well. So we want to thank the bilingue group for presenting, being part of the AAC in the Cloud um, 2022 conference. And uh, thank you all again for your time. It was great and uh, appreciate it.